Oh. <laughs> All right. So um, this is the bridging panel. Obviously, bridging is a massive topic at the moment. Um, I'm currently on the podcast actually doing a series on bridges. I've had Deborah and Sergey on so far, uh, although yours, your episode comes out, I think, in a week and a half or something. Um, but yeah, I think to start off, let's introduce ourselves. And I know, Chris, for this particular uh, panel, I ha I, I'm going to ask you a lot of IBC questions, even though you're actually now at Enoma. So why don't we start with you, Deborah? Yes. Uh, hey, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm really honored to be amongst so many amazing builders. And also thank you, uh, ZK Validator, for putting on the conference. It's been great. Um, my name is Dabra Sampir. I am the CEO and co-founder of Althea, which is a decentralized um, routing and meter billing platform for a distributed or multi-entity broadband networks, um, which sort of led us to needing a bridge between stable coins in the Ethereum and EVN ecosystems and Cosmos. Um, so Althea is also the kind of driving force and team behind Gravity Bridge. So Gravity Bridge is um, a neutral decentralized bridge that's purpose built to support um, the Cosmos ecosystems, blockchains, taxes, and projects. Very cool. I'm Christopher. Uh, I currently work as co-founder of Anoma, which is a uh, occasionally ill-defined, very large set of protocols for coordination, privacy-preserving bartering, uh, privacy-preserving transactions, and a whole lot of other things. I worked uh, previously as architect of the IBC protocol. And I must say, uh, I grew up in Oregon. I had shitty internet. I've never met you in person, and thank you for solving a real problem. <laughs> nice. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here, and thanks for the invite. So I'm Sergey. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Axelor. Um, my background, distributed systems, uh, cryptography, uh, spent a lot of time kind of designing various protocols, uh, you know, standardization of standards like BLS signatures and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, sometime as a faculty at the University of Waterloo, and uh, now we're working on a secure transport layer for uh, Web3 with Axelor. Very cool. Um, Chris, I actually want to, as, as you were doing your intro, I had this question that came up. So you work at Anoma, like now, you're now co-founder of Anoma. Is Anoma in any way an in interoperability project? Do you think of it that way? Um, Is it a bridge in a way? I guess I'm not convinced that interoperability will be a separate component of projects okay. writ large. Uh, that's how I would answer that question. That's uh, very... But certainly we, we want to use and contribute to standards such as IBC. Very cool. All right, so I think um, to start off, I think actually this speaks to this idea of bridge philosophies. Let's maybe start there. Uh, each of you, I mean, IBC, Gravity Bridge, Axelar, have different philosophies potentially. So I'd, I'd like to explore what those are. Kind of what is, what was the, what, what are you setting out to do specifically with each of these? I'm going to say bridges for now. I know we have different ideas on what the name of these things are, interoperability zones or something like that, but let's just use bridges or bridge technology. But yeah, what's the philosophy of Gravity Bridge? Oh, good question. Um, so uh, we... And what's the goal, I guess? Right. And, and first of all, I'd like to also share that, you know, uh, my co-founder and uh, CTO, Justin Kilpatrick, really did a lot of the design um, and, and did the technical lift of the bridge. So I'm here representing sort of the business aspects of it. And I hope that, you know, folks will find that kind of interesting as well. Um, so when um, we looked at designing the Gravity Bridge, we wanted something that was going to be simple. Um, it was going to be reliable and secure because we were looking at our end users, which are other Cosmos blockchains, um, you know, uh, DEXs and other like infrastructure in Cosmos. Um, so with, with that in, in, in mind, um, we, uh, we sort of looked at basically um, 
let me kind of back up a little bit here. So basically looking at the user case of other, other blockchains, you don't really want to think about your bridge, right? Um, I don't want to have to think uh, about whether it's operating. So we wanted to make something that number one, um, other blockchains didn't have to think about, was always going to work, um, was very practical, was gas efficient for their end users as well. Um, in fact, with Gravity Bridge and the batching technology, we're able to get sends as cheap as one-eighth of a cost of a normal ERC-20 transaction. And um, we wanted it to be able to um, be simple enough that we didn't have to have an upgradable uh, contract from the Gravity uh, Soul or the Ethereum contract, so that makes it very secure, but expandable um, in that functionality. So we spent a lot of time really getting those fundamentals right. It's not a lot of bells and whistles and flashy things, but um, it just works and you don't have to think about it. Cool. And one thing about it is, like, it's, it's primarily focused on connecting Ethereum to IBC, right? Like that, it's sort of this one to many, many to one, would you say? Like that, is that the primary goal of it? Yeah, I think, you know, um, we want to do, yeah, yeah, EVMs, right? We want to do things well, right? And then iterate on that process. I think, you know, to Chris's point earlier about, you know, maybe interoperability is like part of the innate future. Um, I think that may be the case, but for now we're at, <laughs> yeah, yeah. for now we're at a situation um, where we want to do things, uh, you know, get that user adoption. It really is focused on um, what works now um, and what's needed now. Cool. Okay, IBC. If you're going to put on the IBC hat for a moment, uh, what is the philosophy of IBC? What does it do? What's the goal? What's the goal of it? I mean, I think most people here know, but let's sure. Just, I mean, yeah. I would relate the philosophy of IBC to at least for me the philosophy of uh, decentralized infrastructure in general, which is to allow those who are using a system to also control it. Of course, those mechanisms aren't perfect. I don't think we've succeeded yet. You know, validators and the users of a blockchain are pretty separate groups, uh, but maybe we've made it closer than you know one party in like you know the Fed bank far away, right? So we want to bridge those gaps. And while bridging those gaps, we also uh, you know communities want to interoperate as they control their own infrastructure. They also want to interact with other communities while. Uh, in some ways, perhaps limiting the way that they do so. If interactions, you know, that they might have with other communities could lead to harm back to their community in the future. So IBC just provide IBC is unopinionated about the content of those interactions, but yeah. it tries to provide a framework to allow the choice of how to interact with other communities to be deferred to the user. And that's so. and that's the thing is it's it's a framework, it's a standard. It's not a zone of its own. IBC is not a token. It's yeah. not. It's completely non-competitive. It's not. You know, you don't have to do anything or buy anything or be anybody or talk to anybody yeah. or adhere to any. You know, it's just a standard. It's like people a can use. It's a language. It's a language. It's a glue between the zones. So this is just sort of nice to start to see those comparisons. Okay, let's talk Axelar philosophy. Yeah, it's been <clears throat> pretty and simple goal. from day one. It was to allow any user to use any asset on any chain, all right? So, and I think to get there, you know, you have to realize, kind of you need to have three core properties. I think one, you have to have decentralized and secure architectures that scale, right, and support um, decentralized protocols at the bottom. Two, you have to think about, you know, how do I enable what I call as like one-click experiences for the users, right? Um, it's like, I click. My transaction goes, it arrives in application, it's executed. I don't have to think about you know, bridging protocols or anything like that. And um, I think a third one is the scalability, right? I think our goal from day one has been to build a secure kind of transport layer for Web3, and that includes being able to connect you know, millions of chains and thinking about what is the architecture that's going to look like? You know, is it a combination of IBC, maybe other things? How do we get there? And two, being able to do arbitrary you know, information exchange. So not just token transfers, being able to send messages, being able to exchange you know, NFTs and so on and so forth. And so I think those three core properties, security, one-click experiences, and arbitrary scaling is what we're focused on. I feel like with a lot of the bridge projects, I mean, one question that people may have is like, we have IBC. Why not just encourage everyone to, enable, like, to have this as the standard? Are there reasons that you're thinking about maybe where this either doesn't work, I mean, I, I have a few ideas on that, or that you don't even want that to be the model of the future. You wouldn't want every network glued, like kind of connected to every network, but rather have some sort of hub. 
Yeah, that's, that's another great question. Um, I, I think IBC has a lot of the idealism that um, blockchains really strive for, right? That uh, resiliency and decentralization. Um, but I think there could be a potential pitfall here in that we are we could end up designing a uh, app blockchain or a specific blockchain to um, the need to interact with IBC um, mm. rather than designing f for what's best for that blockchain. Um, and I certainly think um, what's exciting is we now have, you know, a lot of new blockchains sort of um, coming online and new bridges and we have a multi-bridge future. That um, marketplace is probably going to start to inform what our ultimate IBC protocol looks like, right? Mm. Um, but I think uh, absent of that sort of competition in that building, we may end up designing um, a product that isn't, doesn't have product market, market fit. I mean, so I guess just to step back, I think, you know, my first, I guess, interaction and, and thinking about IBC in general were like in 20, uh, what was it, uh, 2018, I would say, or maybe early 2019. So we shipped the um, Algorand blockchain with my co-founder, Jorgos, and, uh, you know, we're thinking about interoperability protocols, right? And, uh, you know, we kind of looked at Cosmos, IBC. I mean, great stuff w w was built, and we we're just thinking, well, how do I adopt this to the Algorand uh, blockchain? And, um, you know, um, kind of a, why the model is great, the practical engineering hits you pretty hard in the head uh, pretty soon, and like especially like for our grant, I think we'll literally have to like rewrite a lot of the consensus pieces just to make it to work. So um, it was really hard to, you know, convince anybody to do this. I would say, and it was really hard to, you know, allocate those types of resources and say, well, you know, now we have to change like the way we build consensus for the last. Yeah. It was f four years from the research <laughs> until, you know, until we ship the blockchain, and so that engineering kind of hit us pretty hard in the head. So. <clears throat> hard to scale across if you want to innovate on other yeah. things. That being said, though, I do want to decouple a little bit. And, I, and uh, you know, recently wrote a blog where we try to structure a little bit different layers of interoperability, right? And I think it's important to understand, like, there is the kind of the transport layer of interoperability, there is a verification layer, and there is a message semantics layer, right? And I think it's, you can stay, take IBC, you could also decouple it in those layers and say, well, who provides the transport? what provides you know, message verification, which are light clients for mm -hmm. the purpose of IBC, and what are the packet semantics on top of it, right? Like what is the format in which we send messages? Um, so while I, I think the verification pieces serve pretty hard to scale, the light client, you, know, you could decouple these layers and say, well, m message semantics for IBC could be reused across different ecosystems. We can code those on top of other transport layer or verification layers while still being able to talk to one another, right? And so- They're already decoupled. <gasps> I know they're decoupled. I think very few people know how to actually work with that decoupling. <laughs> so, and like understand that yeah. piece. So, but yeah, so I think it's a, um, yeah, so I think it's important, yeah, to <laughs> educate people on the decoupling and what we can do with it to kind of continue making advancements faster. That's actually, that leads to a question I just was thinking of, which is like, would, would it make sense to build, I, like to not rebuild IBC, but like since it's hard for other blockchains to implement it, it's mostly built to work, I guess, with the Cosmos SDK, but like, could it be rethought to work with other kinds of blockchains or is that cr like a crazy idea? Uh, I, I, I think it's tragic that it hasn't happened yet. Okay. I mean, there, uh, maybe it's worth distinguishing between IBC, the sort of theoretical protocol architecture that has like a spec and abstraction such as light clients, and IBC, the concrete implementation, which is easy and you know, inexpensive in terms of developer time to merge into your blockchain you know, in a few weeks. And the former has a kind of extensibility that the latter doesn't yet have in practice. Yeah. So there are great implementations of IBC available in the Cosmos SDK and Go and in Rust, but you know, for other blockchains with other light clients, other signature schemes, even if it's sort of possible in principle to integrate that into the IBC model, uh, it, if, it, if it's not yet uh, cheap enough practically, then yeah, people may not do it. Um, hmm. The boundary of IBC is not a fixed thing. So IBC is like, just a sort of set of abstractions around interoperability, just as like TCP is a set of abstractions around sending packets. And you can come up with, uh, say, new light client algorithms, which would expose different uh, consensus algorithms to the IBC ecosystem, or you can come up with, you know, I would say like, Gravity Bridge, not the instance, uh, uh, but perhaps the protocol could become part of IBC. You know, it doesn't, the, the, we can, 
separate here the concern of what should the specific instantiation be now, which is a very pragmatic one, uh, not to devalue it at all, uh, but that, that has to be made on, on, I think, on the terms of like what, it, what are the conditions at the moment, who can work on this, who wants to use it, like that has to be made on the basis of practical considerations. Uh, whereas we can also leave the path open for you know, the topology of real commerce on the network, with, which the security architecture, in order to be secure, has to reflect. We can leave that topology open to future change by building the protocols as a kind of stack which is independent of the specific like tokens and the specific instantiations. Yeah, I just 100% agree with that. And I, and I think that the market is really going to drive, you know, how this, this um, you know, moves and changes. I also think, too, that, that we, we all still have this fundamental, like, kind of tooling and node infrastructure issue that sort of is where a lot of these pain points to evolution of both IBC and bridges is, you know, kind of hurting right now. Um, one of my questions was about, like, could bridges become this sort of centralized point of failure? But before I go into that, it's like... The IBC world, the way that it was originally presented was very much like this mesh or this net. Is that, like now that we're starting to see it in action, are there kind of like still hub and spoke kind of entities forming even with IBC? Like is that, is, is it a perfect mesh basically or not? I mean, <clears throat> so yeah, I have like a lot of thoughts on this, but uh, I do think you're gonna see, you know, hubs, and I think you're gonna see spokes, right? And the, I think it's, I think it's sort of fundamental for the blockchain ecosystem. And here's the reason, um, you know, whenever you're talking about like peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, right? Like, look at two extremes. Okay, extreme number one, everybody's connected directly to each other. Great extreme. What is what is the result? The result is like, and you know, in the order of n squared connections impossible to manage, right? Like, you know, nobody's gonna run so many relayers, nobody's gonna maintain so these many connections, that cannot work, right? The alternative extreme is that you have, you know, one hub and everybody talks to that hub. Again, what is that hub gonna have? A million connections? Probably yeah. not, right? Um, you know, so you're gonna end up like in an architecture where, you know, there are some hubs, there are some peer-to-peer -peer connections. How did the internet shape up, right? It's sort of, uh, you know, you're going through multiple hubs. On average, you're taking kind of a 10 to 20 hubs to send the packet. Mm. The challenge with that on the blockchain space is that every time you take an extra hop, you take an extra security assumptions, right? So you're trusting another validator set, maybe you even wow. trusted another protocol, and like those continue amplifying and amplifying. And so you end up with pretty much nothing if your packet has to go through, you know, 20 security assumptions and kind of hubs help you uh, minimize the, the trust assumptions as you're kind of moving the packets uh, from one connection to another. I think it's kind of interesting, though. I think it's a bit more nuanced on that because many of the validators run the relay or infrastructure, right? So we were talking earlier about like interchain security um, and liquid staking, and then also the sort of problematic um, centralization of like white boxing and white labeling validator sets, right? So perhaps it doesn't really look like a hub and spoke model from the outside, but where really we, you know, we are. Um, you know, doing that underneath the hood, right? So I think mm -hmm. there's there's other sort of, um, you know, perhaps more nuanced and more subtle ways that centralization and aggregation happens across at least the Cosmos ecosystem. Yeah, I would add to that that part of the design of IBC, which hasn't really come into practice yet, uh, is uh, fault tolerance for uh, Byzantine behavior, not in the sense of Byzantine validators, but in the sense of Byzantine chains within the ecosystem. And we haven't seen this yet because we operate in this nice world where we're all friends and we go to conferences and talk to each other. You know, people are rational, but they're also kind of nice and they don't want to be rude to the guy who they're having drinks with. We're not yet in brutal competition, um, nor are we in like cases where there are, I mean, most of the usage of blockchain is imaginary financial speculation, let's be honest. We're not in cases where we're dealing with real world power structures who will try to subvert uh, many of these mechanisms for their own specific ends. And I think mm. continuing to design protocols that are tolerant in this way is extremely important, even though we're not going to see that realized for a long time. So, you know, it's not clear if proof of stake will work in the long, to in the long term, considering like the practical economics of validators and like how delegators make decisions. There are lots of areas in the design space that need to be explored before we can see these things in practice. Hmm. Um, I had a question, and I'm blanking a little on what it was. What was it? 
while you're thinking of that, I could actually uh, continue the conversation. I, I, I think that it, it is interesting that you, you bring up, you know, hey, we're all friends, we all go to conferences. One of the things that's really interesting to me about Cosmos is like the ecosystems are the same, the validator sets are the same, the communities are the same, you know, we all cross pollinate a little bit, right? So what sort of happens when we cross pollinate with our security, right? We sort of uh, do that with, the, you know, liquidity, there was questions about what happens with those derivatives, right? Like, how does that actually affect, um, you know, I would be curious your thoughts about that in terms of like bridging or interoperable protocols too, because um, you know maybe these communities start merging more and more together, right? Staking derivatives are terrifying. They keep me up at night. <laughs> uh, I mean, in some sense, it's easy to turn anything into a fungible asset, yet fungibility is also the very property which like uh, say validators are secure only because they are not fungible. Right. If votes are a fungible commodity that you can buy, then you you know you no longer have any kind of guarantee provided by the decentralized. Well, and I think we're state. already seeing that with like things like bribe DAO, and you know that's already you know coming to the ecosystem where we have to decide where we what we feel about it. Sorry for derailing. No problem. Thank you because it gave me a second to find my question, which had been actually this original idea of the point of failure. Our our like bridging zone. So. I think IBC wouldn't necessarily fall into this, but like a hub of IBC connections could, or these bridges, or these interoperability entities. Are they, I mean, we have examples of hacks that have happened, oddly, well, except for the re most recent one, I guess. Oddly, they either get bailed out or they, the funds get given back. It's sort of still friendly. Um, but yeah, what, what about, like, are the bridging areas, are they going to become the points of attack? Are they a point of failure for these larger networks of blockchains? Um, I mean, yes, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think in some sense, it's like no different than um, kind of just building in Web3, right, or DeFi. I mean, I always give an example like, okay, like early DeFi, we saw hacks because people were shipping, you know, crappy code, not auditing it, didn't know how to design things securely and so on and so forth. And we kind of went through a couple of years of iteration until we see protocols now that, you know, even sometimes they still find, um, you know, find, find vulnerabilities. So, you know, interoperability is a new space. So I think we saw a lot of ad hoc solutions being rolled out, uh, which hopefully will get replaced over the coming years. Um, so I do think we can make it, you know, better, and I do think we can make it secure. I mean, that being said, I think also, I mean, we've been exploring some ways you can actually compose security across different um, across different protocols or potentially across different paths, right? So, for instance, you can imagine that like I'm in a I'm a protocol, uh, you know, on on Ethereum or in Cosmos, and I actually would check that like two paths have verified my traffic and those are like independent paths and only then I execute a message and only then I uh, sort of authorize it. So you could actually do quite interesting things to compose, make security to better, remove some of those centralization uh, uh, kind of problems that you talked about. Uh, you do have to have very kind of strong engineering on the back end and uh, you know rigorous audits and things like that. Cool. Yeah, I um I think a lot of these hacks are somewhat mischaracterized, right? So what's happening here is the trade-off between security and usability and ergonomics, speed, um, things like that, right? And a lot of the reason why um, the bridges, the bridge hacks get paid back is because really those those bridges aren't necessarily acting as an interoperable, um, neutral infrastructure layer. They're really operating like it with Axie, it was you know mm -hmm. it was an Axie bridge, right? They're operating to serve some other kind of thing. So they make the trade off. Um, for a more efficient centralized design, which you know um, then leads to the very problematic design challenges. <laughs> um, so I think that's imp that's why it's important that um, that neutrality and the interoperability of that infrastructure layer itself is really important, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't make those trade-offs um, in terms of efficiency. Uh, and I think as the tooling and, and, and efficiency, like with gravity, you know, um, right now it's even a, a profitable and sustainable bridge. Um, you know, we're able to get gas costs down. As these bridges become better, um, then people will be less likely to make those choices. I mean, at least that's what we hope. Um, but I think to a lot of end users, a lot of these security properties are just not, you know, disclosed, right? So for them, it just all seems like, well, are all bridges bad? Yeah. Um, you know, and in, in many cases, this isn't even really a decentralized bridge, it's, you know, a three-person multi-seg or something. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I would say growth incentives are dangerous. You can only optimize for one variable at once. If you optimize for growth of your system and sacrifice security trade-offs whenever those decisions come around, then eventually it will fail. Uh, you know, it's not... The good news is that, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate battle testing in the sense of do consumers who are using these systems understand the security models? No. Are they community catered to? Honestly, no. Are there intensive organizational efforts being put into telling users like how precisely the system could fail and enumerating the ways in a way that's understandable when doing so would be contrary to the financial interests of the organizations operating the web apps? No. I mean, but at least <laughs> we're battle testing it and there is, you know, the question is whether that feedback will translate into kind of a collective consciousness of which sorts of system designs uh, uh, have which properties in operation or whether it will be sort of warped and, and never really uh, uh, result in the right bridging protocol, such as IBC, being adopted. Uh, really my bias <laughs> there. I would say one more thing, and I promise I'll shut up. Um, oh, no. Currently, we get away with bridge designs that are basically content blind. So as in the security of a bridge, you know, we have some formula, we have some like uh, decentralized validator set controlling the bridge, and all transactions across that bridge are treated as the same, uh, both in the sense of like we don't subject them to different confirmation times or different uh, additional authentication through separate paths, and in the sense that to the user, we don't like, uh, the wallet doesn't wait for longer. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not changing uh, the like dynamics of what we treat as finalized or secure based on the content. I think that is, it's nice and it's convenient, but if we look at real world systems like banks, of course they authenticate transactions based on content. If suddenly I wire everything in my bank account to uh, you know, somewhere in, in, in Southern Africa, my bank will go, what on earth are you doing? Um, of course, finding ways to do this that are also permissionless and uh, preserve privacy app, is yeah. hard. Yeah, 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 it's very hard. Um, but uh, uh, there are like users could write their own sort of configuration for what to allow on their account if we move towards a more programmable account model. Um, well, and, and I think in that model, it becomes very interesting, um, the community governance aspects, right? You know, you have something like what happened with Juno, right? The social consensus, um, would they be perhaps censoring those transactions? The community saying, no, we don't want this or not, or we do. And maybe that's a good thing, but I do think that there, it, it, it's um, a bit, uh, it could be optimistic or dystopian. Yeah, transparent blockchains are a terrible idea. Stop using them. There will be authoritarian governments in the West in like, they're already authoritarian. It's going to get worse. Do you want your financial history now to be visible in 10 years? Are you sure? You can never undo it. I'm, sorry. That's about to lead me to the next thing, which is privacy, but go, go for it. But yeah, no, just kind of a quick little add, right? Like, I think to your point though, like should bridges like, you know, treat transactions sort of differently and things like that. I, I, I don't think, like at least my philosophy, like bridges should not treat transactions differently, but you can get that security at the application layer at the, at, at the entrance and exits, essentially. Right, right, yeah, right? Yeah. Because I think if bridges start doing that, I think you're going to lead into, you know, pretty bad, kind of complicated designs where you actually have to manage this complicated infrastructure layer, but you can do all of this at the application layer. Yeah, so I want to, we don't have too much time. I want to open up to questions, but first I want to just bring up the topic of today, which is privacy uh, and bridges. It's a topic I feel like I'm kind of constantly trying to like put into the conversation, but it's clearly not like a bridge topic. Privacy, like I don't know of any bridges who are like thinking first and foremost about privacy. That's why I was asking if Anoma considers itself sort of a bridge, because if so, you'd be the one that I, that I could point to. But yeah, how, how do we think about bridging and privacy? Is it always going to be an afterthought? So I think, um, you know, no matter how much I love privacy and like, you know, I spend my time in cryptography, I think privacy is always comes after you get some functionality. Mm. I think we're in a phase where, you know, we're still kind of setting up this core connectivity pipes and like dealing with attack vectors. So, um, you know, I think that's why people haven't thought about privacy too much yet. I mean, that being said, I think, you know, we talked about it last week, right? And I, I'm super excited to kind of compose interoperability with privacy preserving like hubs or, or networks, right? Where you can kind of send packets uh, do some privacy preserving operations within it and take your messages or assets out somewhere else. So I think that would be the first use case where we'll see kind of privacy being composed with um, other ecosystems, which uh, I think is going to be really powerful. I like that distinction too, because I think often when we think of bridges, we're thinking about token transfer, so moving tokens from one to another. But when you start to think about bridging messages, then you can actually 
you're doing something in the private zone, but it's not just that you're putting tokens in the private zone. That's exactly. very different. You can like, move some part of computation yeah. or state, do some stuff on it, get the result back, and without having to like bake into privacy into you know your layer one from day one. So you can talk to NIM, right, or yeah. some other chain to kind of get some of those properties. And I think one of the challenges always with the bridging idea is that the way we've been thinking about it is you'd have maybe a zone or a chain where you'd have maybe a shielded private part, but in order to actually interact with the bridge, they all of a sudden unshield or decloak, as I've been trying to push in our last episode. Uh, <laughs> start, let's put a Star Trek reference in there. But they have to basically reveal themselves before actually moving over the bridge. And this is where the privacy is often lost. And I think this example of using the message passing part of the bridge is kind of a cool thing to think about. I don't know, if, has it been mapped out? Is this something that any of you know research is being done on what that would actually look like? What could it enable? Privacy on message passing in bridges? Or? No, it's more like being able to do message passaging into private mm. networks and doing something in there. We're starting to do this with a couple of par partners, okay. um, yeah, with like Manta Network and a few others. So I think it's early days, but yeah, I think we can, we can map it out. Yeah, and I know Henry from Penumbra is here somewhere, so I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that at some point. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add one point just earlier to on the topic of general, like privacy and bridges. I think there's an intersection here that isn't discussed very much, which is that privacy has big implications for bridge security. Hmm. Because m many of the, if you like model the attacker of the bridge, they have some, in order to determine like what to attack, how to attack it, they need to be able to glean information about what is going on. And generally, especially, they need to be able to glean information about the content of transactions on the bridge. Like, is it valuable to go attack this bridge? Yeah. Uh, is there a lot of you know, funds there or transactions I could thwart or something like this? And if all the transactions are private, that's much harder. So privacy can have benefit. Of course, it also makes it harder to see, like, is there something going wrong? Yeah. Uh, so there are, there are complex trade-offs. Um, on the second bit, I would say, uh, I mean, privacy in a like complex distributed system such as you know the IBC ecosystem taken as a whole is in the sense that where how users are using it, interacting with multiple chains, going through multiple chains, privacy is going to be as weak as the weakest link. The weakest link will be bridges if the bridges are always enforcing yeah. decloak on one side, cloak on the other. We need private hey. bridges. We need it to be standardized. Um, we at Anoma, let me show one sec, will help, try to help, and hopefully Anoma, Anoma, Penumbra, you know, anyone who wants to basically can adopt a kind of IBC shielded transaction standard. Awesome. I think my, my, I also think this is really fascinating, and I think over the next few years, we'll, we'll definitely see this evolution, but I think one of the, the reasons why we haven't seen more progress on this right now is just some of the, like, the node infrastructure uh, issues, and we have to, you know, share so much information right now um, that, you know, the, the encryption overhead is even harder, higher than you would if we could pare down um, and we had better tooling in the Cosmos SDK infrastructure. So, um, you know, and, and this is even between when IBC first started coming out and and the failure rate versus where we're at now, I think is a really a testament to, to everyone there. But unless we, number one, um, you know, sort of work on that pain point, and number two, find ways to incentivize working on that pain point, so it makes sense that, you know, um, you know relayers uh, can run a light enough infrastructure that they're able to make money, and, um, and th then I think we'll see the privacy follow that. But we have this kind of big you know, work to do that's kind of boring and um, <laughs> right now isn't well incentivized, totally. that core infrastructure. All right, I think I wanna open the floor to questions if there are some. Ah, there we go. So, so, first of all, thanks uh, for the panel. Like it was really interesting. And uh, I have a few questions. Uh, one is about uh, token fungibility. So what is your answer to like importing uh, different versions of the same token depending on which bridge you are using? And another uh, question I have is uh, about bridge monetization. Uh, like as I guess we are approaching into a multi-bridge uh, ecosystem then uh, how to guarantee the development and the, and the continuous like uh, uh, management from a technical perspective of bridges and uh, That's great. and then like what uh, what is your opinion on on Peggy that is oh. the bridge uh, that Siftion has been running for one year uh, okay. about Ethereum and cost. So you have three questions. That's it. First one is fragmentation <laughs> of liquidity or like exact like the same. This is I th just to be clear. It was like if you have multiple 
uh, versions of the same kind of bridge token on one network. Is that uh, the yeah? Exactly. Or? It's uh, like how to avoid uh, to have uh, the the Ethereum version of Osmosis uh, against the Ethereum version of another bridge, and yeah, yeah. so getting into the token fungibility groups and make yeah. sure that we are all working with the same version so of token. So let's start with that one, sort of this. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great question. I, I, you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, maybe last year or so be before, I think there was like sort of the thought that maybe there could be like one bridge would be the standard. And, you know, obviously that's not the future. We have a lot of great bridge teams and um, so different assets is, is is the reality. Um, I think, you know, certain like fungibility, you know, ICIF chain has actually really led the conversation on that, um, which is unfortunately not <laughs> really gotten a lot of traction. But I think there's some also some interesting ideas about pooling the assets too, um, that, you know, with, with liquid staking or superfluid staking, that could be also somewhat interesting. So, um, you know, we're gonna have to, we are going to have to face this reality very soon. Yeah, I mean, I think from the business, like can be solved. I think if you decouple again, like application lo logic from transport logic, effectively the application logic, you can, you know, you can have things like, you know, author authorized transactions from like this bridge or like this path, and like only then they can be minted. So um, I think like you you need to decouple. The reason we're dealing with it is because token transfer has been baked into the bridges, which is horrible. So I think you have to like you know separate logic a little bit and deal with it at the application layer. Um. Uh, asset fungibility uh, can be solved at the protocol layer. It just hasn't happened yet. Uh, you need two-phase commit between the three chains involved. Then you can get rid of the diamond problem because uh, all of them agree that it won't be double spent. And then you can treat them as fungible and mm. it's safe. But it requires consensus protocol changes and <coughs> cough, public goods, infrastructure funding, cough. Uh, <laughs> those don't easily happen because we're all busy launching more tokens on different blockchains. We should all just work in one organization and it should build one blockchain and we should be done and it should work. You know, oh, one, one protocol. blockchain to rule them all. <laughs> one protocol, one protocol, many different blockchains, you know, but one protocol or one like integrated set of protocols. Uh, all right, question number two is about maintenance and tokens on the bridges themselves. Uh, yeah, the monetization of bridges in order to make sure uh, that the bridge is sustainable from a funding perspective. So Gravity Bridge is profitable right now. Um, we really designed that so that the, you know, the token holders could get any sort of fees that they would through community governance pass in the native tokens um, that come through. Mm -hmm. So that makes a really um, you know, uh, aligned, I think, way of interoperating with the other blockchains who are core customers. Um, and uh, the relayers uh, relay profitable batched transactions. So um, you can send uh, transactions instantly or uh, you can choose to send uh, transactions uh, you know, when they're batched um, and then they're relayed when they're profitable. So right now we're seeing um, you know, folks that want to spend less gas um, you know, and, and get into a max transaction, they're going to be you know, an hour to like four hours, somewhere in there, and then instant transactions first go across. But right now it's working, it's profitable, and it seems to be um, you know, able to be scaled in that same way. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, monetization and uh, long-term um, sustainability is no different from like layer ones or other infrastructure projects. You know, you, you charge fees for processing requests, and you know you just have to make sure you, you know, cover all the gas costs on the on the chains you're bridging. So you just have to kind of be a little bit careful there. But um, I think it's it, it, it's it's not too hard. In some sense, you actually have a lot more flexibility because you're dealing with you know multiple tokens and multiple networks. So you can you know charge a little bit more in the source. Uh, uh, you can charge a little bit less and things like that. So you have a lot of parameters you can tune in. I want to see if anyone else has a question, because we did answer two of yours. Cool. Um, maybe it's kind of too new, but with interchain accounts launching, like, what kind, <laughs> what kind of opportunities does that have for like executing transactions in a private way on blockchains other than the blockchain you're on? And then would, if you wanted to do something truly private, would you have to be in like a fully private zone and you could only then interact with other private zones or is there actually scope to have privacy from like a non-private zone to a private zone something like this I don't know if anyone <laughs> so oh. I'm just I'm just wondering like what kind of opportunities there are for like um, executing actions privately through interchain accounts but whether there would be limitations on, as you're saying, like 
privacy is dictated by the weakest link, like would you, it only would really it be reveal? relevant if you're just dealing with fully private zones and such, or could there actually be an opportunity to have private actions executed from like a less private zone or something? I mean, I think this is, yeah, a little bit back to the kind of conversation we had with, uh, you know, general message passing, and I think interchain accounts is sort of in that direction, is that you can, yeah, pass an arbitrary message to ask, you know, a different zone to execute, like, computation on your behalf, right? So as long as, like, you know, you have zones that expose this functionality, you can, um, you know, you can send them information there, you can ask them to do interesting things in a, in a privacy-preserving way. So, yeah, I think of interchain accounts as, like, a step towards that. Did you have a question? Um, is this is this on? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that question was necessarily specific to bridges. It's maybe more of an IBC question. But um, yeah, I wanted to to ask. Um, there, it, it seems like there's a, a like a time preference um, that's starting to that we're starting to see in message passing. So um, the gravity gravity chain, for instance, um, does batching on like a daily basis or something like that. And I think Axlar uh, has some options where you could do like uh, low time preference, high time preference. Um, how do you see the, the kind of classes of user and, and message passing evolving and uh, and how, how do you imagine kind of servicing those users? That's interesting. Different timings. So to, to harken back to an earlier presentation, so Nim earlier talked about a mixed net, right? Um, and if you have in this hypothetical world, which we don't live in yet, but where we have private cross-chain interchain accounts, and now all the transactions are in private, then we have the like statistical attack problem. Because you can see, if you see which messages are going between which blockchains, even if they're encrypted, you can perform timing attacks. So batching helps with this. You want to batch private uh, transactions or private actions in that way for the same reason that you want to batch packets in a mixed net. Um, and I would say, yeah, I mean, there are like a lot of interlacing dimensions, I guess. You know, batching can often save on costs, but it can also provide additional privacy. And in the long run, that might even be the dominant consideration. I think the question also has to do, though, with like these preferential tr treatment for like some users right. going faster, right? We're kind of like treating, we're, like we're putting everything right now under the umbrella of bridging. Yeah. But like, w what we're starting to see is like actually a segmentation of the market into, okay, I'm a, an MEV trader and I need like fast execution and maybe maybe so fast that I want to use a centralized bridge rather than a decentralized oh. one. Um, uh, or I'm a privacy preserving user that it has like a low time preference and I can wait like a month for something to come out of the bridge and be fully anonymized. Um, there's Oracle messages or NFTs versus fungible messages. Like these have, these are also kind of segmentation of the market. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in your views and, and kind of like how this differentiation in the market is, is going to play out. Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, and I think you know Gravity Bridge really sort of uh, came from the uh, onboarding of like more users in the, that that aren't currently in the crypto ecosystem. So that's where a lot of the thought process around batching and making cheap transactions and exposing those choices to the end user. I mean, I think is ultimately um, you know the the goal of what we need to be able to do. The crypto market is still you know small, right? Mm. And and we're going to need to be able to. Uh, support institutional capital, support a larger um, set of, you know, real world users. Um, and so, uh, and, and um, you know, we need to build for that sort of user choice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean I, th I think in some, in some sense, like the problem is again, like no different than like problems on layer one infrastructures themselves, right? Because, uh, you know, gas fees sort of dominate <laughs> in some sense uh, performance. And so, you know, depending on how much user pays, like they'll get uh, a certain process in time. And I think kind of bridging being infrastructure um, inherently suffers from the same problem. I mean, I think privacy here it can actually help, right? And, uh, um, you know, with you know, either batching or just privacy preserving ways that, you know, you cannot front run users because you don't see what the transactions are um, as, as they're moving through the bridge. So, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, it, uh, it's a similar problem that I think just expands beyond bridges. 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, it, uh, how to think topologically about sort of user prioritization from a protocol design perspective depends on what we want the system to be able to provide as product level guarantees to users. And one thing we might want like a financial system to be able to provide or sort of economic system to be able to provide is quality of service for individuals taking actions in the physical world that are predictable in advance. I want to be able to buy coffee. I want to be able to pay my parents far away. I do this, you know, roughly at this frequency. They're like real world things happening. Um, in order to provide that, I think we probably just cannot get around the hard problem of identity. Uh, like you want, to, you, if you want to provide, most, you know, with mo mo most people do with their credit cards or sort of interacting with economic systems, it's a few times a day or something in a predictable way. Uh, I think it's critical for UX reasons to be able to provide predictable low costs and guaranteed like low latency for these uh, specific interactions to users. They can plan their lives out in advance and we probably won't get that without identity. One thing I wanted to, you mentioned QoS, right? So this is like very much that intersection between internet though too. So right now the carriers decide like the QoS, right? So I guess my point earlier was that I 100% I agree with you, um, but I think it does have to come back to like, let's make deliberate choices right now that expose this QoS to users so that they have that choice. Cool. All right. I want to say thank you to the panelists of the bridge panel. I know we've gone a little over, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're about nine minutes late. My apologies. I, we got into it. <laughs>